All right, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, I hope you've all taken your speed listening course beforehand. Again, this is about curriculum architecture design via facilitated group process. I'm going to talk about this um, and cover the phases of the outputs and the teams that you might do for this. And I'm going to point you to some uh, resources that are available for free um, that uh, can take you even deeper into all of this. I did my first one of these when I was an employee at Motorola back in 1981. There was a guy that came in to do a one-day workshop for our leader at Motorola's Training and Education Center, the forerunner to Motorola University. And it was Ray Svensson, and he came in talking about strategic planning for training and development. And one of the things that he mentioned was this notion of a curriculum architecture and how that was a part of strategic planning to figure out, you know, exactly what are the needs, what should we focus on strategically to meet current day uh, operational issues and future needs. And Ray talked about this and I really, it really struck me and I really liked it. And I had a project for my audiences in Motorola, which were manufacturing materials and purchasing. And I was, had been given an assignment to tackle uh, the needs of all Motorola manufacturing supervisors across five business sectors, 30 different facilities. And I had already conducted the analysis. So one of the things that I did then is I borrowed Gary Rumler's process mapping uh, format, which was the swim lanes. He invented that a long time ago, or I think, uh, or he got it from the military perhaps. But anyway, so I took what I had learned from Rumler about swim lane and I created, I used a swim lane uh, process map as a, as a training and development path. And I was able to take content that was uh, required by a, a manufacturing supervisor wherever they existed in Motorola and put that on the path. And if you were from one of the five business sectors, strategic business units, um, I had content to match that if, you, if that was uh, where, you, where you existed. And if you were at one of the uh, divisions and if you were at one of the facilities, there was content that was shareable across the board and content that was unique to you if you were in the strategic business unit, if you were in a division, if you were at a facility. So I was able to lay that all out in a big giant path. It was a bunch of flip chart pages all, all uh, taped together. It went wrapped around three of the walls in my cubicle, even blocking my cabinetry in the cubicles that uh, we used to have. Um, and that got a lot of attention. And this Ray Svensson, who had told us all about this, came and saw this one day. He was brought over by the director of the, of the unit, Bill Wiggenhorn, and to show him this curriculum architecture that you know Guy had created. And Ray was impressed with that. And uh, my wife happened to go to work for Ray uh, because the executive director at the Motorola had uh, put them together. And they had done a project with Exxon's exploration unit, and they had all this analysis data, and they asked me if I would take a couple weekends one summer and create a curriculum architecture for their client. And so I did that, and that was well received by the client. And then later on, I left Motorola and joined Ray's small consulting firm. And I uh, became the master of curriculum architecture design for him. And after I went to work for him, he told me, you know, uh, when I was at the Bell Center, uh, Center for Technical Education, um, there was that notion of curriculum architecture, but no one ever actually had done one. So I had done the very first. And so that became my focus in a consulting uh, world since 1982. Now, uh, you need to adopt some of what I'm going to tell you and perhaps adapt the most because I use uh, old school language, if you will. I talk about training and development instead of learning and development because I'm an old school kind of guy. Um, and I'm trying to keep consistent to a lot of things that I wrote back in the 80s and 90s and after that, um, so that it's not hard for somebody who's trying to figure all of this out. I wanted to keep it somewhat consistent, but there it anchors me back in you know 1980s language, if you will. So but you're going to need to do what I've had to do throughout my career, and that is adapt most of what I've been, what I've learned from others. And you need to speak the language of business and you need to speak the language of your enterprise and convert things so that it resonates, it speaks to, it communicates to them. Don't use my language, uh, 
you probably won't like that. Uh, I'm going to have a slide on Q&A um, a couple of times through this presentation. So if you want to put your questions in the chat area, the moderator will bring that to me at the appropriate point in time. I'm not looking at the chat, by the way. Um, so since 1979, I've been in the training and development biz. Um, and I learned on day one, based on a newsletter from 1970 from the late Gary Rundler and the late Tom Gilbert about something that they called guidance, which Joe Harless later coined as job aids, and most people called it job aids before we started calling it performance support. But so after we've investigated a potential training effort, a potential learning effort, we have a couple of options. We can leave it to informal learning means because perhaps the return on the investment doesn't warrant making the investment in the first place. People can learn it through trial and error. They can do social learning and talk to their neighbors. So there's other, you know, they're not, we shouldn't tackle everything just because we've uncovered a valid need from a business perspective. But the default option that I was taught was that we should do standalone job aids and just give guidance, give, provide the instruction via a job aid. But sometimes job aids should be embedded in training because the job aid is tricky. The pilot that's uh, invest, you know, looking at the bottom of the airplane before they take off with 300 passengers is using a job aid. And that is because we don't want them to forget it. But that's tricky, high risk, high stakes performance. And so they're probably were trained in the use of that job aid before they go off and use it in their world of work. And we should reserve option four training for memorization or honing critical skills when the job performance demands that you have memorized something because it's needed immediately, as soon as possible, and there's no time for referencing things. Or there's a, a critical skill that needs to be honed, uh, overcoming client objections in a sales call or welding or whatever. So since 1979, I've been practicing this with job aids is my default response, but in truth, most clients don't like that. They don't like just job aids. So uh, it just struck me a few years ago that we actually just embedded job aids in the training so we wouldn't have to have that tough uh, disagreement with the client who didn't like what we were proposing. We just put them in training and in instruction. Uh, and that way we avoided that, that uh, having to talk about that. So curriculum architecture design includes three of these five methodology sets, and I'm gonna talk about all of this, but it's, there's a design methodology unique to curriculum architecture that's fed by a common analysis methodology that feeds all three levels of my instructional design methodologies. And there's a project planning and management methodology set that helps you, once you've mastered it for one, you can do it for all. All right, so a curriculum architecture design doesn't produce any new content. It simply defines what are the performance requirements, what do you gotta know to be able to do the performance, what existing content do we have already that we can reuse as is, or perhaps after modifying it, you know, what do we have? And therefore, what are the gaps? And then we can take the gaps to the client and get them to prioritize meeting the gaps or leaving it to informal or social learning means. Not everything needs to be learned formally. Anyway, so this was the methodology that helped you do that. The second methodology, my MCD modular curriculum development, well, that's equivalent to ADDIE. That's where you build instructional content, job aids or training. Um, and so I have, that's a typical standard kind of a things. Um, and then I also have this third level, which because I've been asked by clients to develop just the demonstrations that could be, you know, have content added to that to create an instructional program, but we just need the demonstrations now. Or we need that final practice with feedback session, which we're gonna use as a performance test and tie that to a pay progression program. That happened to me back in 1979 on a project that we did up at Prudhoe Bay in Alaska on the oil fields. Um, but anyway, so those are the, the methodology sets that I use. Now for curriculum architecture design, I have four phases. And we'll talk about the key outputs that come from each one of those phases. And we'll talk a little bit about the teams. 
So how long does this take, guys? Is this like take 27 years to get one of these done or is this, can this be done shorter? Well, the project that I did last, Crick and Architecture Design, at the end of 2018, took three months. The project before that took three weeks and it was for the same client, a group in Atlanta in the healthcare business. Um, and it all depends on how well you can organize the people resources to get them to come together and do whatever their particular assignment is. I have analysis teams, design teams, project steering teams of the client and key stakeholders, and they're the, usually the hardest ones to get together to review and approve what has been produced. If I strip away some of all of that and just look at the outputs, there's a project plan that's produced. There's some target audience data, depending on how many target audiences you have in a project, there's you know, one or more. And they're either working together on the same set of processes, you know, in a, in a cross-functional process, if you will. And so there could be one set of performance model data, or there could be more. And once you've gotten that down, you can be able to systematically derive all of the enabling knowledge and skills and put those into matrices so you can show people where this knowledge, awareness, knowledge, or skills are needed in the performance that people have to do. And then you can begin to look at all the existing training or instructional content that you have or informational content that you have and figure out how you might reuse that so you're not reinventing wheels, so to speak. And you can move into a design phase and you can create modules that, that you can inventory and then there's events. And modules are like chapters in the book and the event is a book, if you will, as an analogy. Uh, and then you can construct paths for a job or a job family. And that's like creating, well, here's a reading list for you of the books that are all modulized. And if we have different target audiences, some of the chapters in various books could be redundant, shared across many different audiences because they each need that. It's equivalent to putting, you know, cut and paste functionality in various products like PowerPoint or Word, et cetera, et cetera. And we, the last thing up there at the top right of the design phase is an individual training and development planning guide. And then down at the bottom right, it says gap priorities because curriculum architecture designs don't create any new content. They define the need. They define what you've got against that need and identifies all the gaps so that they can be prioritized and resourced as appropriate. Now curriculum architecture designs fit with the MCDIAD, Modular Curriculum Development, Instructional Activity Development, is my language for that, but you, again, you, this is one of those things you might have to adapt. And so it's like architecting a house. You design a house, but you don't have a house when you're done with the design, you have to go build the house. Or if you're designing uh, office buildings on a campus. You might build all the buildings all at once, or you might build them one at a time, depending on what the uh, economy uh, requires or demands or will enable. So when a curriculum architecture design comes before doing the ADDIE level kind of methodology, that's a top-down design approach, and it's easier than to plan space learning for reinforcing particular content. Because if you train somebody, and they go off to their job and they do what you train them to do every day, all day long, the job reinforces that. But if you train them to do the annual inventory at the beginning of December and it's January and you're training them on that, well, then it goes into cold storage and they're going to forget most of it by the time the, the task comes up. So you would move that content into job aids. Um, so part of the concept here is that as you're looking at what the performance requirements are and what the knowledge and skills are and how you're going to attend to those things, maybe it's on demand and you have to do the space learning. It's like firemen and firewomen practicing firefighting when there is not really a fire. They're honing that skill, they're keeping that fresh, they're using space learning in order to do drill and practice so that they're ready when the fire comes up because maybe it's a particular kind of fire, uh, not your standard you know, wood burning fire, it could be something else. <coughs> so I did this first in 81 and as a consultant, I've done 76 of these, mostly for Fortune 500 companies. 
I've been training my own staff. I've had a staff in the past, not today, but in previous companies where I was a partner, I had a staff between 15 and 25 people. Over half of those people were consultants and I trained them in how to do all of this that we're gonna talk about. First published, co-authored an article on this that was in Training Magazine back in September, 1984, probably before some of you were born. Um, and uh, how do you, how do you uh, keep a training structure from burning down? You do a curriculum architecture, a modular curriculum architecture where you can keep it evergreen, up to date, as needed, piece by piece, because it's been architected or engineered is another term for all of this. My first presentation on this was in the fall of 84 at the Chicago chapter of NSPI, which is now ISPI, and then I did it at the National Conference in April 85. And what's key about this is that a curriculum architecture identifies the component modules of training, micro learning, macro learnings, mid learning, whatever, whatever size is necessary to teach somebody the holistic task set to produce a worthy output. The effort provides a flexible sequence path through the curriculum. If it was a library, you know, what books should you read in what order? And maybe you don't need to read some of those because your job doesn't require it or you already know it, prior knowledge. It identifies the estimated lengths, delivery methods, and development priorities so that the client, your client, can estimate what's it going to cost to put in the priority things, not every last thing, because some of that we're going to leave to informal and social learning needs. It's all about required supporting the performance requirements of an individual job or a function, multiple jobs, people working in processes together, engineers and salespeople or whatever the multiple jobs might be in the processes that you're going to focus on. Anything changed since 1985? My little friend, the performance gopher in the corner there asks, and the answer to that is not a darn thing other than the technology that's used to conduct a project or deploy the content afterwards. Not much has changed at all. It's not necessary. Here's a training and development path, an example. I've modified this from a real world example, but I'll show a little bit here, but uh, this is for the most convenient stores. And you'll see that uh, it's a bunch of instructional events, books, if you will, in a suggested sequence. So each one of those books, events, that's what you would register for, get credit for finishing, blah, blah, blah. And you can see there's a whole bunch of little red circles, half circles, and then blank circles up there. And that tells you what you've already got available as is, what you've got some content on. It's not quite what you need, but maybe it's okay to use for now, but something is better than nothing. And there's the blank circles where you don't have anything at all. But this is the sequence. If we had it all, it would look like this. And of course, if you need to train somebody, if there's a blank circle up there, that means you've got to employ some sort of informal learning, social learning, coach learning, something in order to help people learn that content, that performance-based, performance-oriented content. So whether you've got the content or not, it provides a valuable tool to the management of the target audience because now they can take advantage of what content exists, what content is maybe a little bit out of date or incomplete or something. And there's no content at all for some of these other areas. So management's gonna have to step up and get the job done anyway. Otherwise, guy does not know what he's doing and he's out there performing. How scary is that? Now, it's one thing to have a training development path, but it's another thing then to, that's performance-based, but now you want to personalize this. You want to take an individual and use a planning guide to down select, pull things off of the path that makes sense for a guy's job because maybe he's got a job title like a lot of other people, but his job is different than those people with the same job title because that happens because job titles are an HR convenience and don't necessarily mean that everybody who's got the same job title does exactly the same kinds of things in their day-to-day -day work. And so how do we personalize this path here and pull down what's needed for Guy and his job assignment and skips things that he already knows because of his prior education or experience? Because we don't need to waste shareholder equity training Guy on things he already knows unless that's part of the design and he's gonna contribute as an adult learner wants to contribute. So there's a way to use the path 
and make a specific individual training and development plan that helps them. And the 10 and the 20, there are references back to the 70, 20, 10 reference model where, you know, 70% of what people learn is, you know, through informal means and 20 is through social or coached means and 10 is through formal instruction, like we used to call it back in the old days. So performanceization first and then personalization, if you will. What questions do you have for me? So feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will um, queue them up for Guy. And if it's uh, something that is coming up a little bit later, he'll let you know and, and address it then or he'll answer, um, you know, the ones that are related to what we just did. So, well, be, uh, based on our time limits, does somebody have a question that's come up already? Otherwise, I'm going to move on. No, we have not had any questions right. yet. So, you know, the, I, the speed uh, listening is probably holding them back here. So I, my apologies, to everybody, but we've got a little bit more to cover. So we'll come back and we'll have another one of these and we'll an I'll answer any of your questions you have then. So now I'd like to talk about the facilitated group process. I've been using a facilitated group process since 1979. And I like to pull together master performers. Gilbert called them exemplars, but my Motorola clients in manufacturing said, Guy, we hate that word, exemplars. That's a $3 college word. That was 81, so you know, today that's a $30 college word. So I said, how about master performers? And they said, yeah, that works. Well, you could call them top performers, star performers, whatever. Again, this is one of the things you may have to adapt rather than adopt. And then I also bring together other subject matter experts because maybe the process performance that we're looking at is highly regulated. Maybe we need to bring in somebody from regulatory affairs who knows the regulations inside out, but has never done the job that we're focusing on. And so there's other subject matter experts along with master performers. Sometimes I bring in novice performers because if all my master performers have been in the job for 30 years, they don't know what it's like to be a new person. And so we better bring in some novice performer with six to 12 months job experience who seems sharp and have them go toe to toe with the old guard master performers in case there's an argument about what should be trained first, second, and third when you're a new person because the master performers may not be thinking about that, haven't had to think about that for a long time. So as always, it depends. And so therefore, maybe novice performers are appropriate to bring into a facilitated group process and perhaps management and supervisory personnel. But I often uh, don't like to bring them in because they inhibit the master performers and other subject matter experts who don't want to say something that might offend management. And so these are things that I ask my client, my project steering team to think about as we populate the project with the right people to do the right things at the right times, blah, blah, blah. So these are the folks that would be involved in doing the analysis and design the path and the events and the modules using all the analysis data that was generated, which we're gonna look at in a little bit. This effort can also be accomplished using individual interviews uh, uh, observations, document reviews, etc., but at an increased cost and cycle time because it simply takes longer to do that than bringing people together for a three-day or a two-day analysis meeting and or a three-day, two-day, or four-day design meeting, which is we're, we're going to look at that in a few minutes. Phase one, project planning and kickoff. I always start off my projects with project planning and kickoff. In phase one, project planning and kickoff interviews are conducted. It's the intake process, as it's sometimes called. Somebody brings a request, we ask them a bunch of questions. We may do more due diligence than just taking their word for it and go out and talk to other people, other stakeholders, so that we can formulate a project plan and then take that to a project steering team uh, to review the project plan and to approve it and to resource it with the right people and the other things that we might need in order to conduct the project. At the end of that phase, there's a project uh, steering team gate review meeting and so that they can either decide to kill the project because it doesn't make any business sense to them or to defer it because maybe something else needs to occur before we actually start this project and so it needs to be deferred. Um, or they want to modify the plan because 
that's one way of doing it, but there may be issues and they want to do it some other way, or they approve the plan and resource it and we get going. One of the things I always do with the project steering team, which is the natural client and all other really key stakeholders who will be necessary at phase four to approve the gaps and priorities and step up to the funding and to put this in place. So beginning with that end in mind, we involve them on day one, rather than hit them with a whole bunch of data that overwhelms them, creating cognitive load for them that they can't overcome and they think we're trying to um, you know, baffle them with BS, baloney. Um, so we ask them to handpick the analysis team members for the next phase, who are the master performers, other subject matter experts, et cetera, that we should try to learn from and emulate and train other people to be more like them. So that's what the gain is here. In truth, the only efforts of CAD curriculum architecture design that have failed out of the 77 that I have done were when the, there was no project steering team, no formal group of stakeholders, and my client didn't want to share the decision-making and power that they had, and they wanted to control everything, and even though I warned them, we went through the whole project, and they couldn't get any support to implement, so it was a wasted effort. Um, and they tried to salvage that over the years or they went on to some other job and uh, it's, it wasn't pretty and it wasn't good and it wasn't good use of shareholder equity. In phase one, I have a, a customer stakeholder interview guide for the intake process as it might be called. And that's all the questions are aligned to my detailed project plan. You can see the eight sections of a Project plan, an example of the number eight there, the task roles and schedule. I put all the tasks down and who's gonna do what and how much time it's gonna take of them and put in the scheduled dates and all of that. Um, again, this is something that you might have to uh, adapt rather than adopt, depending on how your enterprise, your organizations are into detailed project plans. I've had plenty of clients that hated detailed project plans and so I had to create a brief project plan based on the detailed project plan that I put together as an external co co consultant, I either price my project's fixed fee or time and expense based on the data and how much was going to be consumed in doing this. It's not just a wild guess as to what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take. It's carefully planned, at least the way I approach these things. That leads to phase two where the analysis target audience data is gathered. Um, we do performance modeling. We do knowledge and skill matrices that capture all the enabling knowledge and skills that is required for the performance. We assess existing content, training and development, learning and development, information, instruction, whatever there is, just to decide what can we use as is and what can we use as a source or what can we use after modification is how I talk about it now. These slides here are from a real project back in 2004 for Eli Lilly. You can see the name in the bottom there. All of this analysis data is documented in an analysis report and presented to the project steering team. And I walk them carefully through the analysis data to, for them to approve the data, understand what performance we're focusing on and what you gotta know to be able to perform because that's what the data says. And it also shares with them, here's what you've already got and here's where you're missing things. And that's really important. So I've done these kinds of meetings, analysis meetings, face-to-face uh, -face and virtually. The first virtual analysis meeting I ever did was for AT&T uh, Network Systems. They had, a, they had a virtual capabilities between conference room to conference room back in 1988. And it's more difficult to run one of those kinds of meetings. It is doable, but uh, it's not uh, just like getting together with people in one room. I want to focus now on the performance. On the left there is what I call areas of performance. Could have been called major duties, key results areas, accomplishments, words like that. But those all carried nuance meanings to people and so rather than struggle with all that I just created my own term back in the 80s and I call them areas of performance, chunks of performance if you will. And in this Eli Lilly example there were nine major steps or areas of performance and the first one clinical and trial planning for 
clinical trial materials. And over on the right is a bunch of performance model charts. This is the format that I use for every chunk. It gets one or more of these pages where we identify on the left-hand side there, key outputs and the key measures, then the key tasks, various roles and responsibilities. So we understand who's involved in this performance performing these tasks. And that on the left, those sets of columns on the left there are ideal performance. These are what master performers say are the outputs and the measures, no kidding, the tasks that they perform and who's doing it. On the right hand side are the typical performance gaps and the probable gap causes and whether those gap causes are deficiency of the individual's knowledge and skills, individual's attributes and values, or there's an environmental gap, a barrier that has to be overcome. And this is captured based on the master performers and why they think non-master performers aren't master performers. Um, and that said, there were 33 pages of those performance model charts there to cover this thing called clinical uh, materials uh, tri trials. Um, and here's the knowledge and skills. I have 17 different categories of enabling knowledge and skills. We go through these systematically to derive what you have to know about company policies and procedures. This was a highly regulated business, so we didn't even use the next category, laws, regulations, codes, agreements, and contracts, because the company policies and procedures and practices and guidelines covered all of that stuff because it's clinical trial materials of pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so the, what we've got in bold here are the categories that we did use and the, uh, the shaded uh, lighter categories we didn't use. Not every project uses all the categories. This is just where I start. Uh, on the right hand side is an example of a knowledge and skill matrices. It's got per category a listing of knowledge and skill items a link back to the performance that they enable. And then some information on the right hand as to whether we select for, for this knowledge and skill or we're gonna have to step up and do training for it. How critical is it to the performance? How difficult is it to learn? How volatile that content may be? Uh, what level does the training or instruction need to go to? Just creating a general awareness or deeper knowledge or an actual skill. This is the voice of the master performers on the analysis team helping me capture this information. And just because you can get a group of master performers to come to consensus on something doesn't mean they're right. They're probably accurate, but it might, it's most likely gonna be incomplete due to the nature of non-conscious knowledge. This project had 17 pages of these knowledge and skill matrices. So we put all of that stuff in an analysis report and, and then we take this, that and get it approved and then we go into a design using all of that analysis data that we just reviewed quickly. We take a design team, which is a subset or all of the analysis team, because I don't like any new players coming in having to reinvent the analysis data and wasting our time doing that. But we go through a systematic process. I'm not gonna show that to you here. I've got that in other books and articles and videos and things. Um, and we create a training and development path with all those modular events on the path. And the design team gets to look at that and, and decide what they like and don't like about it. And they can either kill the project because it doesn't make any business sense anymore or that needs to be deferred until something else happens, or we need to modify the plan going forward, or we need to get on it and, and implement the plan that we've got, and they're gonna resource the next phase. But before we do that, let's look at, here's a training and development path. This is the one for Eli Lilly. These all tend to look a little bit different. There's no standard way to really look at that thing. Um, and there's the uh, planning guide that was used then, a couple of examples. You can't read any of that because of course you shouldn't be able to read my client's proprietary stuff. Um, here's uh, for every event on the path, there's an event specification and it says, I have one or more modules, one or more chapters in me, a book. And here's then the module specifications that says, here's the content that's in that chapter. Here's where all the analysis data ended up at um, in a module that was packaged into events. And so that, that's what we're doing with all the analysis data. And we've even got some of these events that have content that could be there, but they're 
is no content because we're even letting the client know for this event, we either have it totally in hand or we've got some stuff, but it's not everything we need or we don't have anything at all. It's a total gap. And that leads us into the implementation planning phase where the client takes a look at this. They're all taken through that. I've worked with my customer to figure out the cost heuristics for, you know, so if you have a gap here and it's a one day course, what does it take to cost wise to build that? Um, you've got some content for it. So maybe it's only going to take three quarters of the typical cost to build that because you've got some content already or it's e-learning, or it's a coach program you're gonna to put together, many different ways to deploy instructional content. My model is group-paced, self-paced, and coached. Um, the, so the client comes together in the final meeting here, and they pick the priorities going forward. And down there on the left, there, that's one CAD project leads to many MCD or IED projects, depending on what the client prioritized. And now that you have an architecture, an engineering blueprint, if you will, you can go forward and begin to populate that to meet the client's perceptions of what they will get in the business for putting content in place that doesn't currently exist or revamping existing content that for some reason isn't meeting their needs well enough. And you're going to reuse it, or you're going to ignore it, or whatever the decisions were made based on the analysis data. Here's an example of uh, something I did for uh, AT&T Network Systems Product Managers. I first did it in 86 and updated it twice for them over the next four years because some of you don't know, but back in the 80s, things were really moving fast. And so there were lots of changes going on in the workplace. And so they were worried about that. Not much really changed here once we had the performance identified. There were minor things that changed. This is one example of one of eight training and development paths produced for Verizon inbound uh, call center, where inbound sales for call center. This was back in 2000. They were putting people into a class and marching them through the entire curriculum as a class and they were weeding people out. There's a little traffic light right here after the uh, fifth uh, event. And that's where they were gonna have pass fail. And so they weren't even gonna train everybody in the class if they couldn't pass this at this point. So they were weeding people out and they had a need. There's a couple of red W's here, three red W's there. That's meant when you could break people out from the training session, take them across the hall to the production environment where people were on the phone taking calls coming in from customers who wanted to buy stuff. But you could take people out of class at those points and put them to work if the volume of calls demanded it or if people were sick and you needed to cover them for some way because this was an issue, a business issue that the client had. And it was an issue that the training folks were annoyed with because the client kept on pulling people out prematurely, causing all sorts of problems, but that's how management does things at times. So that was one of the goals in this project was to figure out when could we actually break people free and put them out on the floor to do some work before they're fully trained guy. Well, yes, we can handle that too. We'll work with your master of performance and we'll figure that out. This is one of two paths produced for the Norfolk uh, Naval Shipyard. Uh, supervisors and, and zone managers uh, in the production environment. Um, this was theirs. This was a project that where we uncovered when we were looking at existing content, we found 27 two hour modules on active listening. This is where sometimes money gets spent on redundant content for redundant for no good reason. And you can see all the blank circles in this thing here. They were, there were things that they did not have that they needed but they did have a lot of content that they did need. And so our goal was to build around what the shareholder, if you will, the taxpayers in this case, had already spent money on. Now, so every training and development path begins with a beginning, a middle, and an end. I take a conference table, I put out flip chart pages on that, I label one page the beginning, another page the middle, and another page the end, and we begin to process all the analysis data. So where are we gonna train on this task and output set? And it either goes in the beginning, the middle, or the end. And you've got to talk about, so when does, when does, when do you go from beginning to middle and from the middle to the end, and when's the end of the end? So you've got to frame, you know, what's that like? And you talk about that with your design team. 
But then there's a middle, and then there's the end. And you'll see that this three beginning, middle, and end turned into four different phases on the path on the right. Because when we do this, this beginning, middle, end thing, it's how we start the process. And we let the data drive whatever is needed in terms of how we organize it when we're all done. But this is how we get started, sorting the analysis data, deciding when we're gonna do it. And every beginning of a path has its own beginning and middle and end. And at the beginning of the beginning is what I call tier one orientations to the enterprise. Welcome to the company, welcome to the division, welcome to the HR function, welcome to your job as an instructional designer. And you know, what's the history of the organization? What are the products and services we render to the marketplace? Where are the marketplaces? Are we global, national, local, what? so that people can begin to get oriented to where they are as a cog in the big machinery. Where are they? Where do they sit? Who else is doing what? How are we organized? Blah, blah, blah. You are trying to demystify that for people so they don't feel so mystified and lost as a cog in the great big machinery. The second set of content in the middle of the beginning is an orientation to the areas of performance. Now, if you were an instructional designer, we might say, hey, you've got these areas of performance. You know, you're going to be doing this thing called project planning and management. And you're going to be doing this other area of performance called analysis. And that leads to an area of performance called design. And that leads to an area of performance called development, et cetera, if you embrace the Andy model or you may have a different model. But so that's where we're trying to demystify. Here's the job. These are advanced organizers. Or we're demystifying the job for people so that they understand what they're getting into if they haven't figured it out already through the recruiting process. Um, and we're letting them know, you know, what tools you have, what outputs are you else you're gonna work with? Are you all by yourself? Or are you working with a team and a group? Is that group the same every time? Or is it different depending on the projects? We're de demystifying this thing, getting people, you know, wading into the deep end of the pool, so to speak. And then, as I call this front end, the beginning always, it's to me, it's always onboarding. And it's always got tier one orientation of the organization, tier two orientations to performance improvement, and tier three, four, and five, which are the immediate survival skills, awareness, knowledge, and skills, and performance competencies that you need immediately, no kidding. So that we don't put people out on the job. And this is real idealistic, of course, because in the real world, it doesn't quite happen like that. But the, but the concept is here, we need to give people immediate survival skills so they don't drown in the deep end of the pool after they're done with the onboarding, that they can, you know, it's swim versus sink. So I talked about these tier one, tier two, three, four, and five, and this is how I tag and organize all my instructional content so that in future projects, I can borrow content to use as is or to create a derivative, to use after modification. I might take active listening for salespeople and create a course on active listening for instructional designers, because it's a little bit different. And the examples and the demonstrations and the application exercises, the practice with feedback has got to be different. We want training and instruction to be as authentic as possible, not perfectly authentic, but close enough, so that guy can learn it and go to the job and apply it with confidence because this looks just like the training session. So organizational orientations, performance orientations, enabling knowledge and skills, shared performance how-tos, and unique performance how-tos because there's a part of active listening that's shareable, but then there's a different part of it that's unique to the job that's doing the active listening. Sales is different than instructional designers doing an intake process. Organizational orientations, you basically can figure out from the organization chart what those would be, how you might structure those things. The performance models that we, I talked about and shared with you, the areas of performance or major duties or whatever you want to call them, and the performance model charts feed tier two, four, and five, because tier two is simply an advanced organizer for what the how-to performance is that's either shared or unique to a job.
And the enabling knowledge and skills basically come from the knowledge and skill analysis that you did back in analysis. Again, I started off in Motorola manufacturing materials and purchasing where reusing component parts was a big deal. I remember being told by the head of purchasing, I heard it along with others at a, at a worldwide global purchasing conference that you were talking about Toyota back in 1981, was using seven different uh, bolts and fasteners and clips to assemble cars, seven. And he took a, did a pregnant pause and he said, guess how many, how many General Motors uses? And he said, 19,000. So which company has the cost advantage? just in terms of fasteners and how you put things together to make an automobile. Seven versus 19,000. Well, of course it was obvious that you know, Toyota had the advantage. So I'm all into reuse. I like the idea about going into my enterprise content architecture inventory scheme and pulling out content and using it as is or modifying it, creating a derivative for the next effort. So I can save the shareholders money and I can reduce the cycle times because it's easier to modify existing content than it is to create brand new stuff. Now my client, a client Christy at Hewlett Packard uh, back in 1991 wrote this about being able to reuse the same basic course design. This is using the course design, not the content for new functional areas, but also having clients edit somebody else's content to make it fit and be more authentic for them. It saves time and money, produces a better product and raises the client's comfort level when you're not always starting from scratch with nothing, where you're reinventing wheels. My CAD project that I did with her then was built out by Daryl Sink and Associates, my buddy Daryl Sink from ISPI and they won an award for this effort and they built it. And, but I had done all the upfront analysis and design, and then he did basically all the development work, the MCD level stuff. So now I'm ready to entertain more of your questions with five minutes to go. What have you got? Okay, be careful what you ask for a guy because they've got quite a few. So uh, here's the first one. Uh, uh, do you consider differences in training needs for Gen Xers and Millennials. Uh, this is coming from Jen. Uh, no. She put that. The answer is okay. no. No, okay. that's, that's, that's a false notion like learning styles. Please don't ask about that. Um, generational differences, there's, it's not, there's not differences. There's people who have preferences for how they might like to consume the content. What the research shows is that people who talk about what their preference is, you know, I'm an auditory learner or a visual learner, um, that Dr. Richard E. Clark, a famous researcher in our business, uh, has shared with me some of, of the uh, results of research that basically says people might even state their preference, but that's not what they actually prefer. So what you need to look at is you need to look at what am I trying to teach people and then decide how you're going to package and deploy that, uh, but it's, it's got very little to do with generational differences. Happy to uh, exchange an email uh, about that all later on after the session here. Next. All right. So uh, the uh, other question was like, where do they go to learn more about your process? But I did give them your website. Yeah, um, we're going to cover a couple of slides on that after this Q&A. Mm -hmm. we'll and, and so they also wanted to know if your uh, sheets are for sale. And... Uh, uh, I, I've got examples of that on my website and you can adopt or adapt those kinds of things and I could sell you my time and services to help you construct something for yourself should you need that. I'm happy to do that. That's what I do for a living. But otherwise you can you can do what I've done for my career. I've taken other people's good stuff and, and uh, adapted that. I've tried to do appropriate attributions of where I got the stuff because this is derived from somebody else's work. Um, but uh, yeah, so the answer is yes, and perhaps no, if you want to just go. <laughs> and uh, here's uh, another one. So what would you suggest for the creation of new curriculum for an organization that is changing their leadership development based on competency models to vertical leadership approach, uh, and that is focusing on changing how leaders think and approach uh, problem solving? 
All right, so to me, everything has got to be anchored back to a business process, an enterprise process. So decisions are made. And so you have to look at all the, what's the performance context that these business decisions are being made. Now, I don't hate competencies, the whole generic competency model thing, but, but if you hired somebody that had all of your corporate competencies, could they step into the job and be immediately successful? No, because they don't understand your processes nor your practices. And so they may have these things that we call competencies, and I'm overgeneralizing here, but, but I'm more about performance competencies, specific tasks that lead to specific outputs and have specific set of stakeholders who know good stuff from bad stuff, regulators, customers, employees, lots of stakeholders, the customer's customer. Um, and so I, 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 there's a way to go about doing this. And I've done a bunch of management uh, curriculum. I've got a, a book out on that uh, that's available as a free PDF. We'll talk about some of those things. Um, but, uh, but there is a way to go about doing that. But, but rather than, than producing something that's general or generic, that's not gonna easily transfer. Now, five to 15% of the world can learn from kind of generic content and see new applications and go apply it in a new context. But most people cannot. And so that's what drives us to try to be as authentic, as, as specific uh, up with our content so that not, we're not expecting that somebody to go and learn active listening for somebody else's job and then figure out how to apply it in their job and they try and they struggle and they give it up and they go back to what they used to do. Um, it affects transfer, it affects uh, the impact of, of our instruction out on the job, back on the job where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Makes sense. And um, we've got uh, two more and one uh, clarification of what PACT stands for. So uh, what, what does a PACT stand for? And then the two questions are, what type of organizations and industries adopt this architecture? And then the final one, how do we evaluate or determine ROI using this modular approach? So the ROI thing is there's a concept from the quality uh, world called cost of nonconformance. So if you're not, don't have what you, what you need performance wise, what's that costing you? So what, you know, what if master, so I had a project with them, that Verizon project, that inbound sales call centers, they had a goal of $750 a day selling stuff. Their master performers were doing over $2,000 a day. But the average employee was doing around $400 a day. Their number is something like this. It's written up in, on my website. Um, and so if you were able to take the average performers and get them much closer to the other performers, you, it's a math problem. So this is, this is sales revenue a day. And the answer was in the tens of millions of dollars because the number of people that they had doing the job and where most performers were at. But yet it wasn't a theoretical construct that people could sell $2,000 a day or above. They had a whole bunch of people doing it, but just a rare slice of the performers. So the goal in our project was to tap into those master performers, figure out what they were doing and figure out how to train everybody else to be more like them. Not everybody's gonna rise up to the level of master performer. You know, we all have our abilities and inabilities and, um, and motivation, but some people were. <laughs> so, so you can attack ROI on this. Industry-wise, I've done this in just about every industry and every functional area in a company. I've done it in sales and in marketing and in manufacturing, materials, merchandising, HR, um, uh, production units. And so, the, I, you know, this is all about performance. And you can go into any uh, industry or function and figure out, well, what are the ideal performance? I had a thing with Alcoa back in the 80s where they said, well, what if this new thing, we're creating this brand new technology on how to cast ingots. And we don't have any master performers. And I said, well, how do you know where you're going? Well, there's this professor in Scotland. I said, well, then there's your master performer. You need to tap into what they know, what they're talking about. And then we'll train your engineers to, you know, learn as much as they can from him. But we have to understand what's the process for casting an ingot and it was definable and that's what we used. The PAC process stands for performance-based, accelerated, 
customer and stakeholder driven training and development. I didn't want to get into too much about uh, all that specific methodology because that's just mine. I had to create this as an external consultant, train my staff so that we would be more consistent and that somebody could do a project three years after somebody else had done a project for a client and it would be pretty much the same and take advantage of all this stuff. And if you've got everybody operating as if they're in an artist colony, everybody doing their own thing their own way rather than in an engineering department, um, then, you know, if you're doing this as the architectural engineering approach, uh, things work a lot better than when everybody's off doing their own thing. So the performance competence, this is what it's all about. The ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. It requires figuring out those tasks and outputs and then understanding who are the stakeholders. Are the regulators, are the executive management, is it the shareholder, is it the customer, is it the employee, is it the suppliers, is it the community outside the, the gates, so to speak? Who are the stakeholders and what do they require? And besides that, what do they want besides what they require? Sometimes it's important to know that too. So all of your instructional content, job aids, training, or whatever you call it in your performance context, it's got to be all about this performance competence. That's what you've got to keep your eye on the ball. We're trying to get people to be better at performance competence. And that's, and we give them enabling knowledge and skills and we teach them topics, but it's really all about tasks, outputs that meet requirements. I got a book from 1999 that I made for free in 2007 because I was trying to encourage myself to write this six pack on the right. These books are available as Kindles and paperbacks. You can see the pricing down there at the bottom. Um, the Lean ISD book, that was, the cover was redesigned by the late Gary Rumler, um, who was my mentor. Uh, and I, I told him, I'm, I, I'm crediting you for my approach to doing the performance analysis. And if you hate the idea, I'll take your name out of my book. Well, he took the book and he read it and he liked it and gave me a nice quote, but he redesigned the cover because he didn't like the cover that I had. This thing won an ISPI award back in, I think, 2002 or three. Um, 80 to 90% of my CAD efforts used a facilitated group process. There's been times when I've had to do the individual interviews, the observations of performers, which is sometimes not feasible if it's a five-year thing to develop automobile platforms, then you can't take five years to do your analysis. So you gotta find some other way of doing it. And you can read document reviews, but I've never felt comfortable that I really understood it at a nuanced level to construct good instruction. I really am using, there's a joke about consultants. What are, what, who are they? They're people who borrow your watch to tell you what time it is. That's what I do. I borrow your master performers so that they can tell me what time it is. And we can collectively then help the client understand where they might invest in instruction for a significant return on investment and what things they should leave to informal and social learning needs. Um, I, but given uh, COVID-19, I would imagine that a lot of these efforts would be done in some sort of a virtual facilitated group process, if not the more traditional individual interviews, observations, and all of that. Uh, I've exceeded my time. My apologies. Thank you for your time today. You can hit me with any questions, comments, or concerns at this email address here, and I'll be happy to uh, have an exchange with you and help you climb the learning curve, the performance curve, or doing performance-based curriculum architecture design. Thank you.